507. In shady green pastures so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. Where the waters cool flow based on where it was feet, God leads his dear children along. Some through the waters, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a soul in the night season and all the day Sometimes on the mount for the sun shines so bright, God leads your children alone. Sometimes in the valley in darkness of night, God leads your children alone. And through the water.
187. So glad to see everybody here today. It's good to have our visitors with us and everyone that's able to make it out here. And, uh, it's good to see a few people on the Zoom meeting. Um, we're also thankful to have Elder Charles Smith again with us this morning. And we want you to pray for him and his ministry and um, pray for him as he comes before us to preach. Um, the Lord will be with him and might be able to feed the sheep. I uh, want to see you pray for Sister Wanda. I saw she was on the Zoom meeting and uh, we're so glad she's able to attend that way. And, um, we keep praying for you, Sister Wanda, and 
Good to see Sister Virginia, want to please pray for her and pray for Brother Jean. It's good to see Sister Ruth, want to pray for her and uh, her brother Robert. Um, we also want to pray for the family of uh, Donna Burris and um, good to see Evan here, want to pray for um, family, his family and uh, the family of his grandpa Xavier. His grandpa Boston is still sick. Or is he? We want to pray for uh, Brother Evan's grandpa Boston as well. Um, <coughs> I want to pray for Sister Merlin. I haven't heard anything about her since last week, but I want to continue to pray for her. Um, I want to pray for Sister Susan's nephew. Uh, I want to pray for Chase Sawyer to see recovering from that uh, gunshot wound. And, um, how is Brother Aubrey doing? Just, he, he keeps recovering. Yeah, that's good. Um, The, uh, we have several ministers on the list. I want to pray for Elder uh, Gary Oot with his upcoming procedure. I uh, want to pray for Elder Stanley Cable. And, uh, how's Elder Anderson doing? He's good. I saw him yesterday. He's yes. doing good, but uh, yeah, I want to pray for him. Um, I want to pray for all our ministers here in the association, wherever they may be. And, um, is there anyone I'm missing from the list? No, Ned Honeycutt. Ned Honeycutt, can we pray for him? He's in the hospital. Yes, okay. Uh, any update on how he's doing? Or? Uh, got an email that he is expecting to be transferred to uh, a rehab facility possibly tomorrow. Okay. And they are still trying to decide whether or not they're going to do surgery on his arm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can you pray for uh, Brother Ned? Jim and Deborah were with him this morning when the doctor. He's got a valve blockage, and mm -hmm. they're going to have a surgeon come in and look at it. Okay. I see. He may <laughs> not have surgery, but they're going to be waiting two weeks to try to get that valve blockage. Mm -hmm. Pray for Brother Ned, and that's so he's in a lot of pain. Probably a third or fourth valve blockage he's had that surgery on, so if he can have it, so we're going to pray for him with that. Was there anybody else you want to call out? Now we'll go ahead and hand it over to Brother Smith. <laughs> Sir, I want to welcome everybody. Today, we <clears throat> not a lot in number, but uh, if the Lord sees fit to be manifest among us, we'll have a big number. Uh, that's the important thing always is his approval, his presence, and his blessings. If that happens, then we can all feel like, be able to say, well, I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord today. <clears throat> Welcome every one of you who may be visiting today here at, uh, at uh, Meta Creek. No other place that I enjoy being any more than Meta Creek has been a long time, many, many years now. <clears throat> I always have enjoyed coming to this church. <clears throat> I love to hear you sing. I wish I could sing, I'd sing with you. I make a lot of noise. I don't know whether you hear it or not, <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> I do enjoy hearing good singing. I tell a lot of people, if you want to really hear some good singing, come out to Meadow Creek, because they really sing out there, and I certainly do enjoy it. <clears throat> we want to pray for all of these that have been named here today. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of people that uh, uh, was called out and uh, we want to pray for them. We 
we're admonished to pray for the sick, and the suffering in whatever way they may be suffering. Certainly much of that is going on all over the world, which we don't even know about. But God knows. He knows where people are suffering. He knows where needs are. Because even though he occupies his throne in heaven, there's not any place that he's not. He's everywhere. And he knows everything. And we want to remember all of these in prayer. What number are we going to sing? 168. <clears throat> what number again? 168. 168. I'm going to ask Brother Tim, if he will, after we sing, to come and lead us to the Lord in prayer. Sing anytime you're ready. As thirst of heart, our water brings, so for me if you will while brother Tim leads us. Just bow with us. Our merciful and gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful once again to have the blessed privilege to be in my house and to sing songs of praise to our Savior Jesus Christ and to lead. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the opportunity to get to meet together with 
our brothers and sisters in Christ and to be able to fellowship one with another and feel the presence of thy spirit. We pray, Heavenly Father, that thou be one in our midst as we've met here today. We pray for Brother Smith as he stands to speak, that thou would bless him with words that would be from thy, from thy word, that would be a blessing to each one of us, that we might be able to hear the good news of our Savior, Jesus Christ, what thou hast done for us, and that we may be able to rejoice once again in the wonderful promises that thou hast left for us in thy word, that we might be instructed in how we ought to live and to behave, and that we might be able to rejoice again in thee. We thank thee, Heavenly Father, for all thy many blessings, for the natural blessings of this life, for the rain, for the homes to live in, and food to eat, clothing to wear. We thank thee for the peace that we've enjoyed in this land, and we, for the freedom that we have to be able to meet together and to worship thee as thy word tells us we should. And we pray, dear Lord, that thou would continue to bless us to have these freedoms as it be thy will. We thank thee for the church here at Meadow Creek. We thank thee for Elder Smith and for our pastor, Brother Eddie. We pray that thou would bless them and strengthen them and encourage them. We pray that thou would continue to call men to serve thy church and to feed thy flock and help us each that we would all be more zealous in thy service, that we would um, be zealous to meet together and to serve thee. We pray thou would bless us in our daily lives, that as we go about our daily lives and we interact with those on our jobs and at school, and that we would live in a way that would glorify thee and not bring a reproach upon thee and upon thy church. Please bless those of this body who are not here today, that are not able to come because of the afflictions of this body. We pray that I will be with them. We pray for each of those that's been called out that are sick and afflicted. Um, please bless Brother Evan and his family and all of those who have lost loved ones. We pray for Brother Ned and for each one. Heavenly Father, the suffering and on the beds of affliction, that thou would heal them if it be thy will, and bless them, Heavenly Father, with thy presence and with the comfort that only thou can give. Forgive us of our many sins. We confess that we are sinners. But we thank thee, Heavenly Father, for the hope that we have that Christ died for us and that he washed us in his blood and saved us from our sins. And made us whiter than snow. We thank thee, Heavenly Father, for the hope of eternal life, that though these bodies die, that one day I will return and raise the bodies from the grave, and that we'll be with thee forever and ever. We look forward to that day when there will be no more suffering and no more pain and no more sin and sorrow, but we'll be with thee and we'll be satisfied. And we thank thee, Heavenly Father, for Again, for thy many blessings, we pray that I would be with us through the remainder of this meeting with everything that's said and done for the honor and glory to our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in his name and for his sake. Amen. Before the Lord Jesus went ascended back to heaven, he commanded the apostles to go into all the world and preach the gospel. <clears throat> this was a direct command to the apostles. Many have interpreted that passage to mean that uh, we're all to be missionaries, we're all to go into all the world, but it was a commandment that was given to the apostles and of course the acts of the apostles in the New Testament <clears throat> is uh, uh, carrying out what 
he told them to do. They were scattered everywhere, some because of persecution. And of course, they simply obeyed the command to go. And everywhere that they went, the gospel, the good news, and by the way, news is something that's already happened. <clears throat> you hear a lot of times that the gospel is something to be told, something to be predicted, but if it's news, it's already been done. And the gospel is good news. Good news primarily about the one who was responsible for it. And of course, that was the Lord Jesus Christ and also those who were recipients of it. And that's all that all of God's people and <clears throat> that are scattered all over the the earth from that time to, to this very day. <clears throat> Good news just simply tells you about what's already been done. If there was part of it that had to be left to you, it hadn't been done. Or it hadn't been left to me, it hadn't been done. Still something to be done. But I think everybody, when they read of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, when he said, it is finished, they know what he meant. The debt was paid. Everything necessary for God's chosen people to become uh, one of his children. Uh, it's good news. Good news. And in the uh, <clears throat> in the eighth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, the beginning in verse 26, we're told about how this gospel began to be spread everywhere. Of course, it began on the day of Pentecost. The Pentecost was the beginning of the harvest. It came 50 days after the Passover. The harvest had begun. That's all about the Acts of the Apostles. And the, the Pentecost, the word Pentecost means 50. It happened, it began 50 days after the Passover, after his death on the cross. The harvest really began in a big way and uh, started going all over the world. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, teaching them. And if you want to know what preaching is, it's teaching, it's making disciples. Nowhere in the Bible have I ever found where he said, go and make members, but go and make disciples. And you can't make disciples without teaching. You can't do it. The word discipline, which disciple comes from means somebody who's been taught the Bible. And he told them to go into all the world and make disciples of all men, teaching them to observe what all that I've commanded you. And here's an illustration here in the eighth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles where the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip and said unto him, I want you to leave here and go south. Go into Gaza 
which we've seen a lot of it in the news over the last few years, Gaza and then on down into North Africa, where this Ethiopian eunuch came from. He had traveled all the way from Ethiopia and North Africa to Jerusalem in a caravan on a wagon. That means that he really wanted to be there. He wanted to go to Jerusalem. And traveling that long, long journey on a wagon wasn't easy. And he had made himself a eunuch to the queen of this, of this Ethiopian uh, part of the world where he came from. He told him, go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. He arose and went. Uh, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, he may have been black. Wouldn't make no difference, would it? I don't know whether he was white or whether he was black, but he was from Africa. He was from North Africa, from Ethiopia. And he made this long, long journey to observe what he came to observe there in Jerusalem, one of the feasts that God had commanded. And uh, he, he was uh, uh, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all of her treasure. He, he was a very important man. He'd made a eunuch out of himself so he could dedicate his entire self to this queen. And he was so <clears throat> obedient to her that she put him over all of her treasure. She trusted him completely. And he'd come to Jerusalem to worship. Made all of that trip to worship there in Jerusalem. And he was going back home. He was returning sitting in his chariot and he not only was riding in the chariot, he was also reading. That wasn't easy, was it? I'm sure he went through some bumpy places, but he didn't let that keep him from reading. How much do you read the Bible? Do you really put forth an effort to learn what it says. Most of us have some reason if we don't do it, we don't have time. Everybody has the same amount of time, but we don't have time. I just don't have the opportunity. There are just other things that so many other things that I have to take care of, I simply just don't have time to read the Bible. Well, when you don't read for yourself, you got to depend on somebody else, hasn't it? Whatever, whatever preacher you like the best, whatever he says, that's what you're gonna believe if you don't read it for yourself. And I can tell you this, after almost 70 years of trying, trying to do it, there's no preacher that <laughs> knows it all. Not one. I don't care if he knows Greek, if he knows Hebrew, if he knows Aramaic, if he's been to college and seminary, he's still trying to learn. And I'm going to tell you why he still has to try to learn, regardless of who he is, where he's been, what privileges he may have had, he still 
still got to try to learn. You don't ever cease to be a disciple. You may give up your membership. You might leave one church to go to another that you think you like the best, uh, but you never give up discipleship. You got to work on it all your life. Uh, he was sitting on his chariot and he was reading from what they had to read from the Old Testament. They didn't have a new like you do. They just had the old, that's all they had. And it wasn't until Moses that they had any written word. And from Adam to Moses, you know how long that was? That was about 3,000 years. They had no written Bible. They did have the prophets, but they had no written word. There was not any church. There was no preacher. There was no Sunday morning service. So what did those people that lived in those 3,000 years, what did they do? How did they get saved? How did they get saved? And you've been told all your life that you got to have a Bible, you got to have a church, you got to have a preacher, you got to believe the preaching, you got to confess with your mouth, you got to be baptized. That's what we've heard all our life, isn't it? What's the answer? How in the world did those people do it in 3,000 years? And it's only been a little over 2,000 years since Christ was here on earth that we live in the New Testament time. How did those people get saved? Well, they got saved the way everybody gets saved. There's only one way, never has been but one way, and never will be but one way. And everybody goes the same way. Whether you live 3,000 years before Christ came into the world, or whether you live 2,000 years after he came, everybody gets saved the same way. And I hope that I can tell you what that is. Anyhow, this Ethiopian eunuch, an African, maybe black or white or brown, I don't know, it don't make any difference, whatever about the color of his skin or what country he lives in, makes no difference, whatever. In the sight of God, we're all the same. We're people. We're people. The Spirit said unto Philip, the preacher, you go and you join yourself unto this chariot where the eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch was and where he was reading what he had to read. And Philip obeyed and uh, he um, he went in, he went uh, uh, and joined himself to, to this chariot. And um, he found out that this Ethiopian eunuch was reading from the prophecy of Isaiah. They had it then, they didn't have it. See, Moses lived 1,500 years before Christ. He wrote the first five books of the Bible, what we call the Pentateuch, five. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, <clears throat> uh, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books. 
of the Bible. They were the first to be written. And <clears throat> Philip said uh, unto him, Understandest thou what thou readest? Now that's a powerful verse. Yeah, I'm sure you have a Bible. Almost everybody has a Bible. If they never pick it up, they feel like somehow or another having one in the home is kind of a protection. It kind of says something. I never pick it up. I never read it. I never pray to understand what I read, but I got one. Wouldn't be hard to convince somebody else that didn't have one to go buy it and put it on the shelf. You know, say, well, I got a Bible. Well, uh, Philip knew that he had a Bible, and so he asked him, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch said, well, how can I? Have you ever asked that question? I bet you have. I bet you have. Those of you that read it the most, I mean, you it's a part of your life to read the Bible, but sometimes you say, how can I understand it? If somebody don't guide me. Same thing that the Ethiopian did, who made that long, long trip to Jerusalem and now on his trip home was reading the Bible. Very, very sincere man. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. I, I want to know if you can help me to understand what I'm reading, I want you to get up here in the chariot with me. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. Somebody tell me where that came from right quick from the Old Testament. Isaiah. What? Isaiah. Yeah, from Isaiah. <laughs> You're right there. What part of Isaiah? 53. 53. You're right. How can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired that Philip would come and the place of the scripture which he read was, <clears throat> it is Isaiah 53, which we're going to look at. He was led as a sheep <clears throat> to the slaughter. Here he's got a sheep a very, very helpless animal like you. <clears throat> You're not a goat. You're a sheep. <clears throat> when I was pastor in Boone, when I was still with the missionaries, <clears throat> one of the men in the church had sheep. <clears throat> he, was, he raised sheep and I remember one Sunday he came to the house and said, I want to show you something. And he took me down to his house, to his home, to his pasture. And there was a sheep laying on its back with all four legs raised up. And he said, I've heard you talk about sheep. He said, did you know that that sheep would lie there and die? If I didn't have him get up, sheep are very, very weak and very, very needful. And here he said he was 
led as a sheep to the slaughter. Here's, a, here's one that's fixing to get killed and get eaten. <clears throat> a sheep for the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shearer, here's another sheep that's just going to be sheared. He's not going to be killed. He's not going to be eaten. He's just going to be sheared, but he don't say a word. You probably have seen that and may have done it. I don't know. <clears throat> In his humiliation, whether he was going to be slaughtered or whether he was going to be sheared, in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. <clears throat> and who shall declare his generation? Who's going to tell about him? He, he's gone. He's going to die. For his life is taken from the earth. Now, he's reading out of the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, if some of you have already turned there. You know exactly what he's reading. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, <laughs> I really want to know I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet? The prophet Isaiah. Who's he talking about? This is, Isaiah lived 700 years before Christ was born. Who, who could he be talking about? Of whom speaketh the prophet? This of himself, of somebody else is a prophet prophesying about himself. Is this going to happen to him? The one thing about it, this eunuch knew <clears throat> that this scripture was talking about somebody, even though it talks about sheep being slaughtered or being sheared, is talking about somebody. And what he wants to know is it is the prophet talking about himself. Is this going to happen to him? Or is there someone else that he is prophesying about? <clears throat> and Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him. Jesus. Uh, evidently, the, the uh, eunuch had not heard about Jesus. He'd been to Jerusalem to observe one of the feasts and travel maybe hundreds of miles on a chariot to get there, but he hadn't yet heard about Jesus. And Philip opened his mouth and talked to him about Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. Now, <clears throat> you might say he wanted to become a member. He wanted to be baptized. But you got to be a disciple if you're going to be a true member. <clears throat> you're going to be that kind of member that may be here for a while and go somewhere else. But once you become a disciplined child of God, once you become a disciple, you're not likely to be going anywhere because you're not serving somebody, but you're serving God. You're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Philip says, if you believe, and you believe with all of your heart, 
then you can be baptized. And he said, I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, uh, Philip had told him a lot. Hey, we're, we're just talking about a few verses after from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, but Philip told him a lot so that he could say, I believe that Jesus Christ, whom he'd not heard of before, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he become a disciple. He'd become a believer and he was ready to be baptized. And of course, <clears throat> Philip baptized him. And the Lord sent Philip away. He probably never saw him again. But the eunuch went back to Africa and rejoiced and what he had learned. He'd got far more than he'd ever got from a feast in Jerusalem before. He believed now that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Now, if we go to the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, you see the New Testament always interprets the old. A lot of people don't read out of the Old Testament because they say, I can't understand very much about what it's talking about. The New Testament always interprets the Old. And this is a, a case of it. We read about it in the eighth chapter of Acts in the New Testament but then it was prophesied in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, the Old Testament. And he starts out, Isaiah starts out by saying, who hath believed our report? In other words, like the eunuch had believed what Philip had told him, who hath believed our report? In other words, the gospel, the good news. Most everybody believes that there's some sort of way, you know, that when we die, we're going to go to heaven. Some sort of way. And most of the time, we, until we really, until we really believe the report of Isaiah. We believe that it's something we've got to do. Most everybody believes that. Even sometimes the worst kind of people that you know about, they think that some way or another, we're gonna work our way to heaven. We're going to do something to get there. Regardless of how they're living, what they're doing, somehow or another, we're going to make it. You know, we're going to earn it. We're going to deserve it. You probably believe that if, you, if you're not a Bible person, you believe that somehow or another, I'm going to, I'm going to make it. Very few people think they're going to go to hell. They tell other people to go there if they don't like them, if they hate them, but very few people believe I'm going to go into punishment. But I'm somehow or another, I'm going to make it. That's the way all people think until they, until they believe the report. 
until they know something about the good news from heaven. Who hath believed the report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Who do you think is the arm of the Lord? Who could it possibly mean and could not possibly mean anybody else? The arm of the Lord that had to reach down here all the way from heaven to earth to find you. The arm of the Lord. And now verse 2 of Isaiah 53 says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. This arm of the Lord is going to grow up. In other words, he's going to come down here as a babe, a baby. He's not going to come out of heaven as a grown man, but he's coming down here where you are as a baby. And not only did he come as a baby, but there really was no room for him, was there? Had to go out to a barn, what we'd call a barn. Don't know what they might have called it in that day had to go out there and be born in a manger. Didn't come down as a great big man flying out of heaven down to earth, but born to a woman that nobody had ever heard of before until then, a woman named Mary. had no father, but he was born of a woman. And, and raised in a carpenter shop. Wonder why it wasn't a Pharisee down in Jerusalem. Or come as a priest like the Pharisees and the Sadducees did. Uh, he was raised in a humble home, a carpenter's home. And he grew up from a baby. We don't know anything much about it. The Bible doesn't tell us anything much about his growing up. anything that we surmise about, we have to guess. One thing we do know that Mary and Joseph had other children. He was the firstborn, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was not the firstborn to Joseph, uh, to Joseph but he he was to Mary, but Joseph and Mary had other children. Wonder how they got along together. See, they weren't like him. They were not sons of God, at least so far as we know at the time. They might have become the sons of God or the daughters, but we don't know that until we read about it in the Bible, and some of them did, I'm sure. But being raised in a home where God the Son was growing up, what would that be like? Can you imagine what that could be like? Being in the home, 
sleeping, eating at the table, maybe learning something about being a carpenter like the dad was. Can you imagine being raised in a home like that? I guess most of us had brothers, and sisters that we were raised with. I had a brother and sister that was, one of them was six years older than me and the other one was, the sister was 10 years old, but I had a, another brother who was two years older than me and me and him had our time together. Sometimes it wasn't too good either. Sometimes he whooped me and sometimes I whooped him, but it wasn't too good. Can you imagine the Lord Jesus Christ being raised up in that carpenter's home from a baby? The only thing we know about him is at 12 years old, he went with his parents down to Jerusalem for the feast that they were attending and he had a long, long uh, talk with some of the doctors and lawyers at 12 years of age and they were amazed at what he said at 12 years of age. Now, he wasn't regarded as that much during the time that he was growing up. <clears throat> he was like a root out of a dry ground. He had no form nor comeliness, no beauty about him. A lot of preachers today love to tell how wonderful the Lord is how wonderful everything would be if you would just let him come into your life. Your life would be so great, so wonderful, so powerful. There was no form nor comeliness that we should desire him. My time's about up, but I'd like to ask you this. I believe that probably every one of you, or at least most of you anyhow, love him and love him greatly. Why? Why do you love him like you do? There's no form nor comeliness about him that we should desire him. So much preaching is, you know, how wonderful it'd be if you just accept him. He would be so beautiful. He'd be so wonderful. You know, you hear a lot of that, don't you? There's no form nor comeliness that word comeliness means beauty, desirability, no form, no comeliness that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of man, of men rather, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Again, I ask you, why do you love him like you do? Why is he such a big part of your life? It isn't anything worldly, is it? Not what the world considers wonderful, beautiful, magnificent. 
because before you became his child, you didn't care at all about him, did you? I don't want to hear about him. I don't care about reading the Bible. I don't want to talk about heaven and hell. I just want to live here in this world and have the best world that I can have. Of course, you'll change your mind. Someday, if you live, you're going to be an old man and you're going to be an old woman. And you know that the time is going to come when you're going to have to leave this world. That day is going to come for all of us. Then you're going to wonder why did I not care? Why did I not care about him? Why did I not have interest in him? Why did I not care about where I'll go if my life comes to an end? I'm going to have to quit there, but before he made you his child, just like we learned from the Ethiopian eunuch, you know, when he asked Philip, is he talking about himself or is he talking about somebody else? And he soon found out that he was talking about somebody else. He was talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And the conclusion that we have to come to is with the Ethiopian eunuch, with me, with you, with everyone who becomes his child here in this world, were made his child all together by him and none by ourselves. <clears throat> there are many people whom I've heard say and you've heard say, you know, oh, one of these days I'm going to get right with God. One of these days I'm going to change. One of these days I'm going to decide I've had all the fun that I want to have. I've practiced all the worldliness that I want to practice. I think I'll change my ways. I think I'll change my life. You hear that over and over again. I've heard it many, many times over the years. But everyone that has become a child of God was made a child of God by this one that the eunuch was reading about. The Lord Jesus Christ. There is no person that ever will enter the gates of eternal glory by his own works but it'll be because he was made a child of God by grace, by God himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I ask you, why do you love him like you do? Because of that grace, isn't it? It's because of that grace that's been bestowed upon you, not of works, lest any man should boast. Instead of boasting, he gets smaller and smaller and smaller as the Lord Jesus Christ gets bigger and bigger and bigger in his heart and in his mind. And the grace of God becomes his theme here in this world. And you love him and you keep growing and you keep loving and you keep growing. One day, 
It's going to be your last day here on this earth, but your first day with him in that eternal glory. Thank all of you for coming. We appreciate every one of you coming to be with us today. And if you're here and you feel like I do love him, I've never been baptized in his name like the eunuch has to be, but I love him. I really love him. And I want others to know I do. And I'd like to be baptized in his name. We're going to sing, give each other the hand of fellowship. And if that's in your mind, in your heart, come and let it be known. What number are we going to sing, brother? 531. Number 531. Sing any time that you're ready. My Redeemer has gone to prepare Blessed mansions of grace by and by Soon he'll call me home to rest With the ransomed and the best Forever will be glory by and by Now I
last verse. When I keep the ransom over on the golden shore, I'll be satisfied. Then I'll join the angels singing praises evermore. I'll be satisfied. Okay, thank you, Brother Tim. <clears throat> you know, it's really good to be able to just kind of get together around the table and talk about it. We don't get to see each other. People don't visit much like, you know, people used to do a long time ago. Uh, we, we need to be together and talk to one another and experience that fellowship. Brother Kevin, would you dismiss us, please? Our Heavenly Father, Lord, as we pause for this time and give thee thanks for the privilege and opportunity we've had to be in thy house. Thank you, Lord, that thou hast given us this message through thy servant, Brother Charles. We ask, Lord, that thou would help us to dwell upon these things, Lord, and we know that thou didst come and thou didst save thy people from their sins, and that we will be like thee in heaven one day, and as we just sang, we'll be satisfied. Thank you, Lord, for this time together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We ask, Lord, that thou be with those that are sick and afflicted, and those that could not be here today. Help us, Lord, in our daily lives and everything that we do. Help us, Lord, to do it as we just think it was done to be. We thank you, Lord, for the health and strength we have, and we do pray, Lord, that thou lead us and guide us, give us provisions that we need in this life to sustain our lives. We know, Lord, thou art the giver of all good things, and we thank you for that. We thank you. Amen. Thank you, brother. I, I enjoyed that sermon, brother. Uh, you mentioned the first five books of the Bible being the first one that was written. I've heard all my life. A lot of people think that Job was the first book written, but I, you know, I can't prove it. Where it goes, so I don't know. Well, I don't really know. That. 